Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mike. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Mike. Uh, it's good to be here this weekend with you guys, and I'm honored to have been asked to talk a little bit about something that uh, is so important to me. Uh, I, I would probably be doing a disservice if I didn't uh, tell you a little bit about my life in this area with relationships prior to the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and it's probably not a story that uh, you guys are unfamiliar with because it's probably your story. Uh, I'm a guy that is incapable of a relationship. Uh, as a young lad uh, growing up in eastern Iowa on a farm, I, uh, I just never fit. Um, by the time I'm 16 years old, I'm punching holes in the wall of my parents' home and having fights with my dad and uh, got thrown out of that little house and uh, had to go live down by the river in a cabin uh for several months one year and just always sideways with the planet you know what i mean just never being able to fit and uh so that's that's the the kind of guy that i bring to alcohol and and when i induce that into my system it seemed like for a little while i could just kind of breathe and kind of be and uh kick off some communication with with other people in the bar not anything real meaningful but but just a sense of belonging a little bit god i yearned for that and i could never carry that with me in my life um i uh ran off into the united states navy when i was 18 two two weeks after i turned 18 years old i thought iowa was my problem so i I got out of there and, and joined the Navy, and um, my first ship assignment was out in Alameda, California. And that's where I, out in the Bay Area, we went off into the, the kind of the neighborhood bars, the kind of bars where the, the conversations weren't about what you did for a living. In fact, it was it was the kind of bars where people didn't really talk too much. It was the bars where you go to drink. And that was understood up front, you know what I'm saying? And and that's the kind of places that I liked. And that's the place where I met my first wife. And uh, we, uh, if you're in the service and you're married, your paycheck doubles, right? And I'm telling you this, this story so you get an idea on the selfishness and self-centeredness that I bring into relationship in, in an untreated state. So there's this guy on our boat uh, from Tennessee. Um, we called him Tennessee. He was a pretty smart kid, and he was married with this gal back uh, in Tennessee, and he told me this story that if you do that, your paycheck doubles, and I equate that to more booze and drugs. Um, so we're sitting at this little local neighborhood bar in San Francisco one Saturday afternoon, and I started talking to this gal that was my drug dealer at the time um, about that relationship. I asked her, how would you like to make an extra $100 a month? And she said, oh, I'd, sure, you know, no problem with that. So I talked to her about this deal with being married, and we could write up a contract and, and go get somebody to do that. And I'd send her an extra 100 bu- bucks a month for the balance of my time left in the service. And... And the contract will write up, will say at, at the end of the service of, of my service career that we'll just file for a simple divorce and neither one of us is entitled to uh, anything else. So, um, you know, and we're just absolutely sloshed when we're talking about this, right? And we, so we have the bartender give us a little sheet of paper and we write up this contract and we buy the guy a couple seats down a drink to witness it. And, uh, <laughs> We we went and got on a bus that afternoon uh, to Reno, Nevada. Uh, nearly got thrown off the bus a few times, just inebriated. Got to Reno, found our way to one of them little wedding chapels, 
and uh, without a plan or any idea, no rings. Uh, I know they're, they're familiar with people like us because they even have a little plastic rings that they give you for those ceremonies. <laughs> and uh, the guy did his thing, you know, he, he married us and... Uh, when he when he got to the point, you know, after the I do's, and he said, "You you can kiss your bride." I looked at him and said, "No thanks." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sis, <clears throat> she's just not my kind of gal. You know what I mean? <laughs> she's definitely not the kind of girl that I would want to bring back to Iowa and introduce to my parents. All right, um, but she had good drugs. <laughs> um, so that you know, that's kind of gives you an idea of what I bring to the table with relationships. I'm just, it's all about me always, and and there's no contribution on my part, right? So fast forward some years, I I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous in in, that, in the Navy. They saw a young guy in trouble and they tried to help me. Uh, several years later, I end up back in AA. Uh, just, you know, like we do, we drive people out of our lives. And uh, I, so I, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I I knew that that my life depended on every area of my life being changed. Nobody had to explain that to me. Nobody had to tell me the only thing that needs to change here is everything. I knew that. I knew coming in this last time that that was the case. And uh, uh, I acted like it was. Uh, I did my first inventory at... Uh, Four weeks sober, I started that deal. Did my first fifth step at six weeks sober. And uh, in the conduct portion of that, and that's kind of what I want to get to this morning. I don't have much time, but I think that's where the real miracle in my life uh, happened with relationships, is really seeing the truth about me and and how I, uh, what drove me in those areas of my life. And I I got to work on page 70 of our book. There's a paragraph that I still, it's one of my favorite pieces of our work. And it talks in there, one of the great things about our inventory work is in there it talks a lot about ideals, right? An ideal, a picture of our higher self, what we can bring to the table. Uh, When I first started looking at that, about my ideal with, with conduct, um, well, when I first started looking at it, it was about sex, and I thought the ideal would be about, you know, what she's going to be like. Like, <laughs> right? And 5'11", blonde, big tits, <clears throat> big bank account, you know. But it didn't take me long to get past that silliness and understand that the the ideal here is about what I'm going to bring to the table. Um. So I really worked with that stuff, and in, in, in there it talks a lot about, uh, well, on page 70 it says we earnestly pray for the right ideal, and I did that. I was guided to do that. It says we earnestly pray for the right ideal for guidance in each questionable situation. I went to my sponsor with that and asked him, what's a questionable situation? And he knew enough about my story to respond to that with, Mike, if you're involved in it, it's questionable. <laughs> right? So the deal there was that I, I should always be in prayer about this stuff, that, that I could move past my selfishness and self-centered ideas. It says for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for strength to do the right thing. And when I think of sanity in this area of our lives, not with sex, but with my conduct in general. There's a definition of insanity earlier in the book that, that I really like. It talks about lack of proportion and of the ability to think straight. And, and with, uh, with the sex conduct or, the, or that area of my life, I mean, you, if you threw a, one of the showgirls down on the strip in the middle of this meeting, it might change the energy a little bit. <laughs> 
You know what I'm because we got all kinds of wild shit about that. Um, so I needed some sanity and some strength to do the right thing. And, and so that would take me in prayer. Uh, it says we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. I got real active in working with guys early on. Two months sober, I started sponsoring guys. And there would be uh, occasionally in those early years uh, maybe an attractive member uh, across the room that I might be interested in. But, hell, I took four guys to the meeting with me. And they're coming up to me after the meeting like, what are we doing now, what are we doing now, what are we doing, you know, and I want to go talk to her, but I've got these guys with me. So that worked, that I I threw myself the harder into helping others. I got sober at 27 years old. I didn't date an Alcoholics Anonymous for two and a half years. Uh, If you'd have told me that coming in, I probably would have had to have a drink to think about that. (laughs) But that's what God did with me. He took this this uh, broken human person that came to him, and, and he, he allowed me some change here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so grateful for that. So when it came time, I was about 30, and I got the, the opportunity to start dating. Um, I did just that. There was no kisses at the end of the night, no no real goofiness with that. It was about getting to know people. And uh, I enjoyed that. I got to date some classy women uh, in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I uh, <clears throat> I met a, a lady in AA. She's uh, Her name's Erica. I was at her first meeting. And I remember sitting across the room from her thinking, damn, it's too bad she's a newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't see her again after that meeting for about 11 months at which time I invited her out to my home group's anniversary. And we've been together ever since. Uh, she's a terrific woman, uh, an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, works with a lot of people. And uh, our lives are blessed today. We, I, I think this, this deal with practicing these principles, uh, it, it really, Don used to tell me, my old sponsor, says, if, you, if you're not doing this in your home, then you're not doing this period and in order to do this in home it requires communication now we're communicating whether we're talking or not right we're communicating whether we think we're we're communicating or not by our actions by 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 how we're how we're being in the home uh so my wife and i have had uh challenges with that it's and that's really where the rubber has met the road for me in a lot of this is with the people that I love the most, the people that I spend the most time with. Uh, so what we do uh, to help us out with that, we get together at least once a week and have breakfast or coffee <clears throat> or lunch. We do it outside of our home environment. We go meet somewhere. Uh, we go over our planners on Sunday nights. Uh, we sit down together and we go through our week. You know, what do we what do we got going this week? When can we get together for our meeting? And that has really helped out. Um, and it's a good life. We uh, we were married. We uh, about 22 months ago, we had a set of uh, twin boys. And uh, that'll that'll give you an opportunity to to do this stuff, too. They're they're a handful, man. But it's a it's a really a good life today. Um, I go to God with egg on my face every night in my 11th step work. I've just not perfected this deal. And what's neat in our home is I know that she does the same thing. And, uh, we come together with, uh, with some, some real autonomy in our home and, uh, a, a deep knowing that our relationship is only based on how good our relationship is with our God. That's that has to be the center of our lives, and uh, that's where uh, the work in Alcoholics Anonymous takes us. It's not about uh, outward uh, relationships or outward appearances. It's about that, that deep relationship that we're 
all uh, availed the opportunity to have with our God. It's like the center of the hoop for me, and if that relationship is right, the rest of them are in balance too. And uh, that's what the step work in AA and working with others and both sides of sponsorship uh, uh, avail us an opportunity to stay right in the middle of that deal. Um, my time's up. I want to thank you for allowing me to share. My name is Lee. I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear? Is that good? Uh, I'd like to thank Bob for the opportunity to share. Um, and it's an honor to be up here. It's good to see everybody, man. Every year I enjoy the heck out of this. And it's so good to see the, all the familiar faces and all the the new ones that this might be your first year. Relationships. I mean, when he asked me, you know, it's like, oh, why me? You know, um, and I know why. I mean, I, I think I know. And, and I talked to him ahead of time. And, and I appreciate what Mike shared to, you know, I'm trying to pay attention to what he's saying, not think about what I'm going to say, because Bob told me just pray, you know. And and relationships for me, it's it's easy. It's uh, you know, what it was like. I build walls, a fortress deep and mighty that none may penetrate. I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving. I disdain. And that's that was me. You know, I'm a rock. I'm an island. You know, I won't disturb the slumber of feelings that have died. If I never would have loved, I never would have cried. That's my life growing up until I finally worked the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's five and a half years into alcoholic sobriety. Stark raving sober, I'm not going to get into my story, but I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I just didn't drink for a long time, and I still felt that way. I do not want anybody close to me because if you get close to me, you will hurt me. Growing up, my relationships were 30 and out, 30 and out, 30 and out, you know, because... You know, I, I would I would sabotage relationship before I let her get close to me because at 30 days she's seen all my songs or seen all my dances, heard all my songs, and she says you need a haircut, and I hear you're ugly, <laughs> and I think to myself, time to get a new one, and I'll. And I swear to God, I shared. I, I don't know if I have time, and I, but I would have separated with my from my wife a couple of years ago, and I was. I've been married now 25 years. My kids ask me, how come mom wasn't 30 and out? And all I could answer is God. 30 and out. The longest relationship I ever had was six months. And it was a sick, 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 sick relationship, but the sex was really good. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm serious, you know, which I don't share. It makes me, but I mean, that's the truth. And then, but, but now 25, 25 years I've been married, and that's got to be God, you know. But I was separated for a little while, which maybe I'll partner get into in this relationship talk here, but... um. And when I was out dating a little bit, like what Mike was talking about, and being a gentleman, you know, I wasn't out trying to get laid. I was going out just being nice to girls. But I did get involved with a couple of them. And, uh, and I remember talking with Bob about it. And, I, and what I found myself was doing was I was trying to get – I didn't want to say, you know, it's been nice, but thanks, you know, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Or I didn't, you know, what I do is try to get them to break up with me, try to make it their idea. And I ne that's what I was like all through co high school and college. That I always was like that. Never spoke with that about that with anybody. I mean, why would I? Why? It's just my own little deal. No one would understand what I mean anyways, would they? And then I shared it with Bob. And I thought he was going to say, what do you mean? And what he said was, it's an art form, isn't it? <laughs> and I went, y you what? And he knew what I meant. And I've sh since shared about it at meetings. Just like some of you guys out there right now are nodding your head. You know what I mean. And it just trips me out. I thought I was the only one in the world that would know what the hell that means about. I didn't think anybody. But, uh, you know, and it was about, you know, power and guilt and throwing the guilt and all that stuff over at them. But uh, I met my wife in the military, and uh, well, I didn't marry her. To, <laughs> I didn't marry her, actually, to get a double income. I didn't even know about that. Um, <laughs> No, man, we were we were at we were still in the 30 day phase more or less, and I'm being it's really not 30 30, but you know in that area, I was in Monterey going to language school, and it was time to get shipped off to go to Panama to go to Central America back in the early 80s when it was a hot area, and uh, and I could either say goodbye, or take her with me, you know, and so I said, well, you want to get married, and so she said, yeah, and here we are, you know, 25 years later, and it's been a good relationship, you know, ups and downs, a, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of good, a lot of bad. But I came into the relationship, as I said, 
not wanting to get close, not allowing myself to get close, and I wasn't ever going to get close. And uh, to me, uh, we got a, Kenny and I have a friend in, in, our, in our home group that talks about uh, relationships or love was a booze, booze and abroad, booze and abroad. And for me, that's what it was, you know, conquer. They were to be, women were to be conquered, and once you got what you needed, you move on. I mean, that, what, there's nothing else, so you, you get another one. And here I'm sticking with this one for a long time, but my behavior really hadn't changed. And when I first, we first got, when I was still drinking, first five years of our marriage I was drinking, and I cheated a lot. You know, whenever I was out on, on a mission or whatever, I was in the military, and whenever I was gone into another country or whatnot or whatever, I'd always cheat. And, uh, but then I got sober. And then when you get sober, there's no real, you know, it's, things change. You know, my feelings might not have changed. My, the way I'm not wanting people to get close to me, but I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to be living a spiritual life. I'm not supposed to lie, cheat, or steal anymore. And even though I wasn't really working the steps, I really wasn't, and I wasn't listening to a sponsor, didn't have one necessarily. I was just stark raving sober. Uh, I was still concerned about cheating. And uh, so I really didn't, but I flirted a lot. I, w I was a big flirt in all, all, all the meetings I went to or wherever I went. And then I was on a training. I was getting going. I got hired, and I went on a went, got sent to Georgia. And I was flirting like I always do. And this one girl, one night, and she she came over to my room, and I told her, you know, I'm married, thanks anyways. But you know, and, and she left. And a few weeks, a few nights later, she walked over and just basically undressed herself, and, and it was on, you know. And and I cheated in sobriety, you know, in sobriety. And I was I was bummed. I had trouble shaving. I had trouble shaving in the morning, because man. How did I do that? You know, my loving, caring wife who would never, ever, 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 ever cheat on me. How could I do that, you know? And then, you know, fast forward a few years in uh, 19, uh, actually on April 12th, I'm an accountant, by CPA by trade, so it's right in my busy season. So on April 12th, 2004, one of, we have four kids, my wife and I, and one of my kids came to me and, uh, and she, actually to me and my wife, and she said, well, I, I won't even go to the details, but it turns out my wife had cheated many, many years ago with uh, the man who at that time I had considered my sponsor. And uh, you talk about devastation. Um, man, and uh, I, I, I didn't, didn't think about drinking at all. I started smoking almost immediately again, but I didn't think about drinking. But... I immediately filed for divorce, immediately kicked her out of the house, and immediately started playing the field, not to get laid, but just to, my motto was, I want to be with a woman who doesn't lie to me, period. Uh, I didn't want nothing to do with her anymore. The kids were on with me. They, they hated her. Uh, it's, and that's where it was. Long Fast forward a little bit. I, I, that's how I ended up with Bob. I, uh, I, was, I had a difference. I had been, I, I, you know, I didn't let anybody get close to me ever, including sponsors, so I would change. And then I heard a tape of him doing one of these talks, and he shared with the people he was talking with that that's the thing, exactly what I shared with you just now, only different names in a different year. And I said, my God, he's got to be my sponsor. And I'd known him already because I used to work at a, the prison. I'd brought him into the prison in Lompoc, and so I'd known him for years. And I was actually going on my way to Lake Isabella to talk at a conference, and where I was... There was no, I was listening to him on this, and there, I couldn't get him. There, I had, didn't have any cell phone reception for the whole weekend. So I didn't, I had to call, I called him like on Monday. I said, Bob, it's Lee. You've got to be my sponsor. And he's been my sponsor ever since. My wife and I, after all these issues, the, all the pain, the, the anger, all the hell we went through, I'll tell you the key, which, you know, I know you guys know already, but those of you that might not, the key, the reason I'm alive, the reason my wife is alive, the reason we're still together, the reason that other guy is not dead, is because of God and the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because immediately, on, I told you, on April 12th is when I found out about it. On April 13th, I did an inventory about what was my part in it. I know he hates, you know, like the, my part, but what did I do? Why, where, where was I at fault? What did I do? Because part of that, it's a, it was one third of that responsibility was at least mine. It wasn't just my wife choosing to go have an affair. It wasn't my best friend choosing to have an affair. I had a part in that. And when I put it down on paper, man, it helped me a lot, you know. And it helped me a, a huge, tremendous degree because it wasn't just them. It was my part, too. I don't, have, I, won't, I don't have time to go into all the other stuff, but I'll tell you this about it, that 
Two, in California, you, got, you can file for divorce, but you've got to wait six months. They don't let, you, they don't let it go right away. And uh, so, okay, fine. I don't care. I'm not going to change my mind now. I'm not going to change my mind in six months, so fine. You want me to wait six months? So uh, during that course of that t six month period, uh, I went to a lot of meetings. I did the deal. I was very involved. Uh, anybody, some of you might have heard me share. I, I, uh, I, I was sh shared about this from the podium, which I should not have done. I cried, you know, I got a lot of sympathy and blah, 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 but I was wrong. So I apologize when he was in those audience. And if you ever hear one of those tapes, please just burn it. But um, two weeks before the divorce was going to be final, I got on my knees to pray like I do every night. It was at 11.30 p.m. And then I remembered, oh, wait a minute, I got to go make my coffee for the morning. I got to read my two pages. I read two pages a day, every, no matter what. Two pages a day, absolutely no matter what, every day out of the big book. Whatever it was. And so I got up off my knees and I went and made my coffee, did whatever I had to do. And then at 12.15, 45 minutes later, I got on my knees to pray. And I said, my prayer that night was, I mean, almost verbatim, God, please let Jacqueline, my wife, please let Jacqueline know that I will always love her, but I can't be with her, God. You know that and I know that. That was about the word verbatim of my prayer. And while I was doing that for 30 seconds on my knees, 45 minutes after I had been on my knees already, my cell phone rang at 12.15 a.m. and it was my wife. And I had told her, leave me the hell alone. And she had. I hadn't heard from her for two weeks, two and a half weeks. I hadn't heard from her. But that night at 12.15, you know, and I couldn't say that was a coincidence. I couldn't say it was just chance. I had to think, then that's God. But then there's that issue about what will they think about? What would you, what would the, the dudes, what would the guys think about me, man? They think I'm a pussy. That's what they'll think. I can't get back with her. But one of my best friends from high school called me. And when in, in the end of the conversation, when I told him I was thinking about reconciling, he said, dude, amen, man. I love you. Good job. And hung up. I went to a convict friend of mine, tattooed out, tattoos all over the place, just gotten out of prison. You know, okay, he's going to tell me don't get back with her. He said, dude, if, you know, if they put up with half the shit we put up with, I mean, if they, we, they, if we put up with half the shit they put up with us, go for it, man. She loves you. Get back with her. Damn, two out of two. But then I call Bob. <laughs> and I'm like, Bob's going to tell me no. Bob's going to say, after all you told me that she did and all the stuff she's done to you and all those feelings you felt, no way. You don't got to get back with her. And I told him what I felt. And he said to me, Lee, if you think God wants you to get back with her, you must get back with her. If you're wrong, you'll know soon enough. I remember that. Verb, that's verbatim what he said. And I went, damn. <laughs> Not really, but I mean, I just was like, oh. <laughs> but I did it, you know, and there's been a lot of hell. It's been like a, it's, it's been a lot of heartache, a lot of pain. But I tell you what, we're happier now than we've ever been in our marriage, 25 years into it. You know, there's lots of stuff. There's issues come up all the time. Not like it used to be. And I used to wish this was like back in the Conan days, back with swords and arrows, and I could go kill that guy, just chop him up, just chop him. And, but Bob tells me it's wrong, and one of my sponsees, my, my sponsees, Kenny tells me, you can't think like that, you know, and I listen, and I don't, and I don't, I don't have those wishes anymore. Nowadays, it's kind of like, I don't know how many people have toll roads where you're at. In California, we have one or two, and sometimes you go through a toll road, and you got to change. You just kind of roll your window down, you throw it on in, and you keep on going. And sometimes you got to stop and dig for change, look all over. And that's what our relationship is kind of like. Sometimes some of this shit pops up. And sometimes I have to change, just throw it right in and work right on through it. And sometimes i got to spend a lot of time with him. And that's the other thing about you know our sponsor that you guys know. is like he's busy as heck, but there's never been a time when if I needed him, he hasn't taken the time and either called me back or, or told the rest of you guys, call me back in 10 minutes and, and stuck with me on it and I've been there for it. My kids and I, you know, we, uh, in New York, Jason was teasing me about all the texting I do with my kids and, uh, you know, my family, the relationships in my family now is absolutely wonderful. My kids love Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my, one of my daughters goes to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, they read the book just like I do and relationships in my family. And my, and my relationships now are a lot, lot, lot better than they ever were before. I, I, I don't trust everybody still. Never, I don't think I ever will unless he teaches, tells me I should and teaches me how. But, you know, I, 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 a lot of you guys I trust. And if it, any, I was thinking about it just the other day. All the people in the world, the people, the person I trust the most is Bob Darrell. Period. End of story. My, and so there's a couple of other people that I have a little bit more tr trust for, but that's a lot of growth for me. And a lot of you guys like Kevin out there, a lot of you guys laughing, you know. I'm, I'm, 
Bob, when I was coming up here to talk, he said, you, he said, Lee, they're going to relate. There are going to be guys out there that know what you're talking about. And I appreciate the fact that you do. Thanks for letting me share. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, my name is John. I am an alcoholic. Hi, wow, what a, what a group, huh? Goodness gracious, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir out here, Bob. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me out. I just um, started working with Bob as a sponsor recently, and uh, he called me up and asked me if we wanted to get do that, have that relationship. And um, I said, yeah, I think that's about time. And um, not too long after, he asked me to speak at this thing, so I'm really, I'm really glad to be here. I've been sober since 1981, and I've uh, made a mess of life um, in relationships like most of us have. I, I hear people say in AA that they drank so that they wouldn't have to feel. Or they, so they, I drank so that I could feel. I was. In, it says somewhere in our in our literature that. One of the greatest disabilities we have is the inability to carry on a meaningful relationship with any other human being, basically with any other thing at all, I think, for me. And when I drank, I had that ability. Maybe it wasn't real. Maybe there was an illusion of it, but it was like Mike, Mike I understood exactly what Mike was talking about. It gave me this ability to do something I couldn't do, to feel a part of life. Since I've gotten sober, that's been one of the hardest areas for me to, to, um, to allow myself to feel in sobriety. As Mike, was, Mike and I were talking a little while ago, and he's from Iowa, and one of my dear friends, a woman I, I, I lived with for about seven years, she's died um, when I was drinking. And we were talking about where she lived in Iowa, and I started to... I started to get real emotional. And I was talking to some other guys out here, and I, and I was really feeling emotional. And I could feel emotional when I drank. I could really feel. I could really. I felt I could feel anyway. And since I've been sober, that's been elusive for me. I don't know if that's been elusive for a lot of other guys, but it's been elusive for me. And I'm glad that came up that we uh, had that conversation. I know that's not dead inside me. It says in. Uh, in our, in our literature that spiritual principles will solve all my problems. That what that means to me is that my experience in AA should do the same thing that that alcohol did for me in all areas of my life, in all areas. And one of the greatest ones, of course, is relationships. And it's not just my, my, my romantic relationships that I'm talking about. We have relationships with everything we, we encounter and I have to use the spiritual principles to allow me to get to, to do that. And if it's not working, then I'm, like on page 164, it says, be sure that your relationship with him is right and great things will come to pass for you and countless others. So the primary relationship that I've had to maintain is the relationship with my higher power. I've had to do that. And since I've been sober, I was on a long dry drunk. I was talking to one of the guys earlier. I got sober in Louisiana in 81, and you couldn't find a big book in Louisiana in 81. <laughs> People were working the, the, the uh, steps out of the 12 and 12. And uh, I had a couple of sponsors. They say, well, one guy told me we'll sponsor each other. And, you know, it's the blind lead in the blind. And uh, one guy told me he wanted me to write my sex inventory. And he was a counselor, and I wrote in my sex inventory, I gave it to him, he said, that's the most twisted goddamn thing I ever read in my life. You can't be in any relationship for 18, but two years or something like that, you know? And uh, meanwhile, a week later, his, he's leaving his wife for some younger woman, you know, and he's giving me advice about sex, so we don't give each other sex advice. But I've gotten, uh, I had five years sober, no real sponsor, and uh, I got married. We went from the wedding to the counselor. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I'm serious. We went from the, I mean, like the, we got married on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday. We were in counseling. Now, I, <laughs> sounds normal to me. What are you laughing at? <laughs> but. Uh, 
I don't know about you guys, but I'm immune to counseling. I mean, it's not that I go in there to counsel them, but it just turns out that way. I heard a story recently that I really found intriguing. Uh, did anyone see that movie, The, the Departed? Where that guy, they were in Boston, those Boston cops, and that, that guy asked that, that, that psychiatrist, that cop asked, he says, you know what Sigmund Freud said about the Irish? He said, they're the only people that are totally immune to psychoanalysis. And he told him, you're screwed, because this whole, you got a whole force full of mix here, you know? And, and basically, but I think what, what Freud was talking about was that a lot of alcoholics like myself, I mean, a lot of Irish alcoholics, and I personally have found that I'm immune to psychoanalysis. I don't go in there with any idea that I'm going to analyze the analyst. But anyway, you can imagine how well the counseling turned out. And I think that <laughs> analysis won't work for an alcoholic like me. It may, 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 may make me know why I did it, but I still feel like crap. But now I know why, but it doesn't give me an answer. That's why I need a spiritual solution. And that marriage ended in divorce. That was my second divorce, one prior to getting sober, and I, I didn't get married again for 20 years, and then I got married in sobriety, and that lasted, didn't even last two years, and we were divorced, and um, I stayed sober for quite a, long, quite a long while after that, I mean, stay, stayed away from women quite a long while after that, about five years, and um, I was, like I said, I was on a dry drunk from 1981 until probably 1994. And I think three of the people, or well, two of the people definitely, three of the people that saved my life was, was, was Joe and Charlie. And I guess you've all heard that Joe McHugh passed away a couple of days ago. I listened to their tapes, and uh, I knew I had missed something. And then I listened to Clancy, and I knew I really missed something. And Chuck Chamberlain, I used to ride my car and listen to Chuck Chamberlain and start crying. I said, I missed something big time. And I got a sponsor, and he started me through the book. I had never been through the big book. I had a spiritual experience in 1981, but I hadn't had a spiritual awakening as a result of working the steps, and I hadn't recovered from alcoholism. And I hadn't had a desire to drink, but I was really sick. And I started going through the book, and um, I'm married today. And I, I this woman I met in... In AA, she was a newcomer when I was in chiropractor college, and she was my first patient in the clinic, and we'd known each other for 15 years. And we'd both been married to other people in that time, and now we're married. And people ask us, How, why did it take you 15 years to get married? And she said, one, she said to someone, God wasn't finished with us yet. And he wasn't. Um, she had a story similar to mine. She hadn't worked the steps. And uh, I, had, I took her through the big book. I said, I'll take you through the big book. But I'm not going to do your sex inventory with you. <laughs> but um, she, since that time, she's found a woman to do her sex inventory. And, and she, our marriage today is run according to spiritual guidelines. Um, and I have no idea how it's going to turn out, things like that. But we put our lives in God's hands. How... I cannot explain to you that by her spending time with other women and me spending time with other men makes our marriage better. That doesn't compute in, for people who aren't like me, who don't have this illness. But we are a, a strange breed. and we, we can't go by the rules of the psychoanalysis and what works for the other marriages and things like that and other relationships. Just think about quality time and all this stuff. That might work for them, but it hasn't worked for me. I, I have to give my life to God on a daily basis and see what he wants for me. And, and my relationship with her always has to be about what's best for her. In relationship, you know, the principles we have, I've learned in here have, have carried me through in so many different relationships. One of the things that, that Chuck says that I, really touched me about Chuck Chamberlain and I've been using this quite a bit recently. He said, I love you. First of all, because you're, an al you're God's kid. And second of all, because you're an alcoholic. If you love me back, it's a plus. So you can add to my day, but you can never take away. And, 
you've been around AA for a while, the relationships I have in AA, some guys I don't like. <laughs> they don't say the right damn things at the meetings, you know, for Christ's sake, they're off topic and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know, alcohol is feel stuff. You walk up to that guy, he knows you're pissed off at him, you know. And as I just look at, look at them and say to myself, I love you, just inside me. And these principles really work. I'm a chiropractor, and I, I work on animals also, horses, dogs, and cats. And this guy brought me a dog the other day. And this dog doesn't like anybody. I got my first referral of a, of a human patient from a dog. This guy brought this dog in to see me. <laughs> and he said, that this dog doesn't like anybody. And the dog, I adjusted the dog and he said, the dog likes you. He said, I'm going to make an appointment. He said, the dog hates that damn vet. If my dog likes you, it must be okay. But the dog would growl every time I went near him, you know. And, and, and he was grump at me. And he had to calm the dog down. Well, a couple of days ago, no, about a month ago, I adjusted that dog. And I put my hands on the dog and I, and I worked through his spine. And he was growling at me and grumping at me. And I, and I just remember what Chuck said. And I put my hands back on the dog and I said, I love you. If you love me back, it's a plus. And that dog just put his head down and something changed inside that dog. And I was like, I can't believe that happened. And that happened again about three days ago when I adjusted the dog, well, Tuesday. I can't believe that. I touched that up and said to that dog, I love you. And the dog changed. And I've been reading the St. Francis prayer quite a bit. I want to know about relationships. I mean, there's no greater prayer I think of, I can think of to help me get through relationships with anybody. My... If I think of what's best for my wife rather than what's best for me and try to understand her rather than have her, have her understand me, that's a hell of a thing to do. I put my sex life in God's hands. That was a big one. My, uh, my wife is a very beautiful woman. She's uh, 12 years younger than I am and she's recently had some hormonal shifts. She's 50. And her libido and stuff isn't as much great as it used to be. And um, it's hard not to take that personal sometimes. It's not about you. But to to say, to, to, you know, to say, okay, I put this in your hands. This is in your hands. I'll have as much sex as you want me to have, God, not what I think I should have. I try to apply the principles to that, to that marriage and, and to that relationship. I deserted two children in New York when I left New York and, and, before, and I hadn't, didn't see them for 14 years. And when I got sober, I, that relationship started after three years. I, I got to, to see them again. And I have a grandson today. And he's, well, he's not, it didn't just happen today. He's uh, be 15 years, he was 15 years old on the 25th of this month. It was just a few days ago. And I just called Bob the other day and I said, I said, I got a call from my, my daughter that he may be coming down to live with me. In fact, it looks like he might come down to live with me. Because of this program and the spiritual life that you, you guys have showed me how to live, she saw something in a man that deserted her that she's willing to give her son up to him. Bob said, this is going to be a hell of a thing. You might think it's sometimes that God has you confused with someone who really wants to grow. <laughs> I have no idea how to raise a kid. But I'm going to apply the spiritual principles to that relationship. Because it tells me in the book that spiritual principles will solve all my problems. I don't have to go outside of this for other solutions. As an alcoholic, I don't have to do that. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Paul Martin spoke at our state convention years ago, about 10 years ago now. And he said, if, if, if you're an alcoholic, uh, recover, uh, if, you're, if you're a non-drinking alcoholic in AA, to go outside of AA for your solutions is like standing on a whale's back fishing for minnows. And I found that to be true. I really found that to be true. I don't know about anybody else outside this program, whether they're alcoholics or not. Those things might work for them, the New Age principles and all that kind of stuff and that therapy, but it hasn't worked for me. 
The only thing that's worked for me is improve that conscious contact. It's more spiritual growth. Every single problem requires more spiritual growth. I have no idea what I'm going to be hit with this afternoon, but it's like, but today, through these spiritual programs, I've recovered from alcoholism, and I'm no longer crazy. I, I an account, I'm not an account, um, a, a contractor who was in the program since went out. We're having our house remodeled. Stole almost fifty thousand dollars from us and took off with the money. People I've talked to in the program said that's a killing offense, you know. <laughs> and um, the same between the Navy. You in the you in the Army? Yeah. And maybe I'm a Marine, so I'm a better shot than both of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a pistol, and my wife has a pistol, and she's a damn good shot. And that guy has no idea how close he is. It wasn't for God. <laughs> how close he is to being busted up, but um. You guys told me I can't do that kind of stuff. I have to understand that I have a part in that thing, too. We realize our fear made us, led us to bad decisions. So uh, I'm going to close with that. I am so grateful to be here among guys like myself. And hopefully we, we have the same solution to the problem, no matter what it is. It's more spiritual growth. Thanks a lot for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.